Well, good morning, family. What are some wrong beliefs that you've had about prayer? Now, I'm not going to make you answer that question this morning, but I'm going to make these people answer that question this morning. And so let's just start off. Let's, let's just start off with maybe some things we've learned or we heard or uh, just some wrong beliefs that we look back now and go, okay, that was not quite uh, what God meant for my prayer life. But let, let's go ahead and, and talk about that. Griffin, we're going to start with you. What are some wrong beliefs you've had about prayer? Yeah, if I think back to, especially early on in my, my walk with the Lord, my faith, <clears throat> I, I always used to ask the question, if God already knows what I'm going through or God already knows what, I, what I'm looking for, yeah. why do I need to spend all that time talking to him about it? Which sounds terrible to say, actually. <laughs> but um, I just wondered, if he already knows, what, what is the true value of taking all of that to him and spending all that time really sharing what he already knows. Thanks for sharing that. Elisa. Mine was that I felt a lack of worthiness. At one point in my life, I got so far away from God that I was very hesitant to even come to him with my request. And it was a journey. I kept thinking, I've got to get myself together before I can go in front of the Lord and and ask him to, to come and be close to me. And when I finally did, it was like he said, Elisa, I've been waiting for you this whole time. Hmm. Wow. Jaycee? Yeah, for me, I, I really uh, felt like prayer was hard work, honestly. Like, almost like, you know that feeling like before you go to the gym and you're like, man, this is going to be really hard, but it was good. I, I do know that, that feeling. Okay, just good. Just record. making sure. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but almost like the more intensely I prayed, like it meant God heard me more. But I just remember him kind of revealing, just reminding me that like what father like doesn't already know like the sound of their child's cry or like what father doesn't, isn't attuned to the, tri- the cry of their child. So wow. it kind of changed everything. Wow, thanks for sharing that. All right, Tom. Well, over the years, as I've led many uh, small groups, one of the most common things that they say is, well, I can't pray in front of other people because I think maybe they've heard uh, people up front who have done it a long time and they think I have to use flowery words and I have to use theological words. But actually Jesus says exactly the opposite. He says, I'm not going to hear you because of the flowery and theological words you use. I just want to hear your heart. And so God doesn't grade on the curve when we have a prayer. He just wants to hear from his children and know that we love him. Love that. God doesn't create on the curve. Well, well here's, here's the reality. Thank you guys for sharing that. But, but prayer can become confusing. Even if we've grown up in church, we, we've heard th- some things about prayer. Uh, even back in Jesus' day, prayer was confusing. And so Jesus talks about it. In fact, he talks about it a bit. And one of the most famous places where Jesus talks about prayer is in the Sermon on the Mount, which is in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. So if you have your Bibles, if you got your phones, you're going to want to go ahead and open them up to Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus talks about prayer. And what Jesus is going to do, he's going to clear up the confusion. He's going to talk about what is important and what is not so important when it comes to prayer. And so if we were just to start with Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, Jesus starts out this way. He says, and when you pray... Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. And so Jesus starts off right away and he starts talking to us about where to pray or better yet, where not to pray. And you may be going, hold up one second. I thought it doesn't matter where I pray. I mean, can I be driving my car on US 19, putting on my makeup and talking on my cell phone and praying to God all at the same time? (laughs) And yeah, you can do that. I mean, you know, maybe if if you're in middle school or high school and you're on the bus or riding your bike or in the car and can can you go, let there not be a quiz, God, let there not be a quiz. Can can you not pray that on the way to school that that there won't be a test or a quiz you weren't prepared for? Yeah, you you can do that. You can pray during the hustle and bustle of life. You can pray kind of while you're, you're, you're running through life. And maybe you're thinking, well, here, here they're praying on, in synagogues, which would be like church. I mean, didn't we just pray in public here in church? And, and street corners, if you pray in public, I mean, what's wrong with playing, praying in public? And, and nothing, there's nothing wrong with praying in public, but Jesus likes to just push it a little. Jesus likes to challenge his audience then and challenge us today when we look at prayer. And back in Jesus' day, a lot of times when they thought about prayer, 
It was public. That was kind of the thoughts they had. I mean, you go to church to pray. You go to the synagogue to pray. In fact, if you were a good Jewish boy or girl, you prayed at least three times a day. Typically around 9 a.m., you would pray what was called the Shema, and it would go, uh, you know, hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one. It would continue, and you would recite verses from the Bible. And then you would pray again at noon, and you would recite more verses and more prayers that had been written down. And kind of the more you could recite, the, you know, the, the more showy-offy it was. And, and, and then you, at 9 p.m. at night, around then, you would pray again the Shema. And so the Pharisees, the religious people of that day, they loved to show off the Shema, okay? They loved to go into church and, uh, and get an audience like such and just go into these lofty prayers and, uh, and be impressive. Uh, what they loved even better was to head on into the market for lunch and maybe uh, look at, oh, the sundial says it, it's about noon. And, uh, and, and there they, they would stop in public there on the street corner and just start praying and reciting these lofty scriptures and show people how much scripture they knew. And Jesus says, okay, it's okay to do that. But if you do that, you have already received your reward in full. Uh, In other words, you got to pray in front of people. You got to seem impressive. Hey, they might be impressed. Congrats. That's about all God's going to do with that type of prayer. It, It reminds me of the street performers in New York. Now, I grew up a few minutes outside of New York City, and, and it was a couple summers ago, I took my family to go see, you know, the house I grew up in, the neighborhood, and then we went into the city and, and spent a few days seeing all the touristy attractions. And, and if you go to New York City and, and go into a place like Battery Park and stuff, there, there's always going to be these street performers that show up. And you know they're street performers because they just start performing, all right? They are loud, they start flipping, dancing, whatever, try to get as much money out of you as possible. And then they leave. And that's about the reward. They get noticed, they get paid, but there's no record deals waiting for them. There's no, you know, movie contracts for them to sign. That's about the limit of what they get. And that's kind of what God's going. Okay, you can do this in public, but that's kind of the limit of your reward. You want to be noticed? Congrats, you got noticed. And then Jesus challenges us a little more. He says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is in secret. Now you can pray during the hustle and bustle of life. You can pray while you're kind of running through life, but Jesus challenges us to start picking some specific locations where to pray. We know that Luke chapter 11 starts the whole chapter by saying, and Jesus was praying in a certain place. In fact, we know throughout the scriptures that Jesus had certain places he liked to pray. And so Jesus is recommending to us Hey, when you go pray, pick that certain place. In fact, he, he uses this term uh, of a room, but if you were to go into the original Greek in which this text was written, it, it really describes a room that's within a room. Kind of like you, you would have a, a house and you have multiple rooms, and then you might have a small room within a room. And in the Greek, it was also called a storage or treasure room. It was the room within a room where you would keep your most sacred treasures. It's a very small room. And Jesus is saying, go into that small room, the treasure room, and spend some time with God building up new treasures. I just think that's cool. I mean, in, in our day, it would probably be like one of our closets. Uh, you know, I, I share a bedroom with my wife, but I got my own closet. And it's a small closet. She's got a big closet. It, mine's a small closet. And, and, uh, and there's treasures within that closet. I mean, I even have a safe in there for treasures. I've got my baseball card collection, my comic book collection, my cards and letters from, from loved ones throughout the years, people who are precious to me. And Jesus is saying, go into a specific place and a place that no one else is invited into. In fact, the, the next verse is gonna tell, it's gonna describe it as a secret place a place where, as the song says, no one else is watching. It's almost as if they couldn't do it if they wanted to. They couldn't even fit in the space Jesus is recommending we go into. And and the idea is that it's just you and God in this specific secret place. It's not for anybody else. No one else is invited in. No one else is, is watching. And how do we know that? Because Jesus says, and go ahead, close the doors behind you. Because we know connection comes when you close the door. If you are married, you know that connection comes when you close the door. If you are married with kids, you know for sure connection comes when you close the door. 
I mean, there, there are those times where my wife and I will tell the kids, hey, uh, we're going upstairs and we're getting away from you and uh, we're going to be in a room. Do not bother us. And we will go upstairs into our room. We will close the door. We will lock the door. And we're not always doing what you think. All right. <laughs> a lot of times we're just trying to talk to each other. It, look, if, if my wife, Erica, and I, if the only conversations we have are through the hustle and bustle of life, and if they're always about the immediacies of what's going on, we could be three feet away from each other and still feel far apart. <laughs> Sometimes we just have to get in a room with closed doors to be able to have an uninterrupted, intimate conversation with each other in order to have a real conversation so we can have a real relationship. We need uninterrupted talk where nobody else is invited in. And, and, and so Jesus, well, here's something I just love about Jesus. Jesus calls out the natural oddities of this situation. He goes, hey, and I know you're praying to that God who's unseen. In other words, Jesus is going, it's no secret that God's invisible. <laughs> I mean, how awkward is that? You're going into a room, it's you and God, but you can't see God. But he can see you. And so what do we do there? What do we do as we're having a conversation with somebody we can't physically see? I love what the lyrics of that song when no one else is watching, I, I love what it gives to us there. And by the way, we're gonna use this song throughout this week in our, our connect groups. We're gonna use this song in our devotional time, our, our secret place time with God. But, but the song says, teach me God, teach me how to love you. Teach me how to know you. Teach me how to hear you when no one else is watching. Let's be honest. Us and God is a lopsided relationship. And God's cool with that. God invites us into that. He says, I know we have a relationship together. And it's very lopsided. I mean, you're a human being. I'm like the master of the universe. And, and you might bring 1% to the relationship. I'll bring the other 99%, but I still want to have the relationship with you. And so it's okay to get in there with God and go, okay, God, what do you want to talk about? Teach me how to hear you. Teach me how to know you. Teach me how to love you better. And if we could just get this one verse practiced consistently in our lives, I guarantee it will change our life. Jesus says, where should you go? To a place that's specific, that's secret, that's secluded, and that is for sharing. Sharing between just you and the God of the universe the sharing of your heart with God and God's heart with you. And sometimes we could think, well, all of a sudden we can get lopsided in the conversation. We can make it a, a one-sided conversation because we're like, I can't hear you, God. I can't see you. So let me talk. Let me do the talking. And I can just tell you what I'm learning more and more in life is that being quiet is being productive. Let me just say that again. Being quiet is being productive. It's amazing what we're able to learn when we just shut up <laughs> and let God do the talking. It's amazing how productive, how, how much things in life come together when we can just learn from the God, the all-knowing God about what to do next. And so Jesus tells us where to go to pray. And then it kind of begs the question, well, why go there? Why pray there? Why spend any time with God? Jesus says this in Matthew chapter six, verse six. He says, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So right away, why do it? Why, why pray? So for some of you are going, there it is. That's what I needed to hear this morning. Okay, if you're telling me that's where the magic happens, Tom, then guess what? When I get home from church today, I'm going into my closet. I'm shutting the door. I'm keeping everybody out. And it's just going to be me and God. And I'm going to go, okay, if that's what it takes for God to do what I want him to do, well, then that's what I'm going to do when I get home. And I'm going to get in that closet and go, okay, God, now let's talk about my finances. Now let's talk about him and her and why we should be together. Now let's talk about that job promotion I've been waiting for. But that's not what Jesus promises. He doesn't promise that God is going to answer our prayer requests in the way that we want him to answer our prayer requests. It, which, that's good news. That's a good thing. Thank goodness that God doesn't always listen to what we ask him for, or, or God doesn't always give us what we ask him for. Because when I was a teenager, I asked for a Lamborghini to drive to school. <laughs> and I'm so glad he didn't answer. I don't think I could have even afforded the insurance, but I wasn't thinking that far. When I was in my 20s, 
I, I was dating a girl and she seemed to have more feelings for me than I had for her and I felt guilty about that. So I'm like, God, let me please fall in love with her. But he didn't do that. And I'm so glad because I eventually met my wife, Erica, and realized what true love looks like. When I was in my 30s, I prayed, God, please let that seller accept our offer and please let us be able to close on that house. And he didn't listen because God had something, a better house waiting for me and my family. And I'm so glad that God does not always answer what we ask him for. You see, the, the, the promise in our prayers is not that you will get what you want. The promise, Jesus says, is that you will be rewarded. That you get to live a life filled re with rewards from a God who loves you when you spend time with him in a place that's secluded, that's secret, where there's sharing and that's specific. And then Jesus kind of tells us what not to do or why not to go in there in prayer. What, what a, a poor motivation. And, and he says this in, in verse seven and eight. He says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Now, I don't think you can blame the people of Jesus' day because there were some, well, wrong beliefs and wrong teachings even back in Jesus' day when it came to the Jews and their prayers. In fact, we can go back in and find rabbinical teachings. You know, these teachings by rabbis, they show up in print and they had certain teachings like, whoever is long in prayer is heard. And they would grow up hearing another rabbinical teaching that whenever the righteous make their prayers long, well, that's when their prayers are heard. And if you were to go to the Greek word heard and what its original context uh, there within the verse, it would mean to be taken seriously. And who doesn't want to be taken seriously by God? And so Jesus is going to challenge their thinking, their teaching. I remember when I was growing up in, in a little town outside of New York City that that we were there at a little church. And, and whenever the church would get ready to close in service, the pastor would, would offer and ask if anybody wanted to close the service in prayer. And I remember as a little kid sitting in there and it never failed. It was like the same, you know, four guys. They happened to be elders of the church would always raise their hand. And there were one or two of them that if they raised their hand and they got called on to pray, as a little kid, you're like, oh no. <laughs> Oh no, we are going to be here for a while, right? We're gonna miss lunch, um, you know, and it would. And I remember there's some of these guys and they would just start praying these amazing lofty prayers and they would just go and go. And as a kid, I'm like, I don't even understand half the adjectives they just used to describe God and describe life. And whoa, they just swapped into King James English because everybody knows God loves Shakespeare. Can't handle modern English, I don't know. Um, yeah, and then we just go on. All of a sudden, there's like a 20-minute sermon packed into a prayer. And, and I'm like, oh, man, we're never going to eat. <laughs> and, and even as I dreaded it, I, I was just sure as a little kid, well, they must be doing it for a good reason. Surely God is impressed. <laughs> Surely God is up in heaven and he's looking down at this elder who's praying this magnificent prayer and God's up there in heaven. He's going, what in the name of me is happening? <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> and Jesus is going, no, no. God doesn't care about the quantity or the quality of your words. He's not up there impressed by how lofty our prayers are or how long they are. No, oh, the pressure's off. The pressure's off when it comes to our prayers. In fact, one of the most impactful prayers I remember ever hearing in my life. I was in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, in a place called Mathari Valley. It's one of the largest slums in the world. It's over a million people just stacked on top of each other in poverty. And uh, we were there, there's we were at this meeting of several American pastors and several African pastors, kind of like the spiritual meeting of the minds. And, and before we started our meeting, they invited an eighth grade girl there who went to one of the local churches and schools there to open us up in prayer. And I remember her prayer like it was last minute or just five minutes ago. It's a very short prayer. It went something like this. Dear God, you are an amazing God. Thank you today that we got to have breakfast. You are such an amazing God who gave us breakfast today. Thank you. Amen. And I just remember like my whole being just seemed to stop for a minute. And I'm like, whoa, 
breakfast, breakfast. Breakfast for me is a daily expectation. Breakfast for her was a celebration of who God is and what he does in our lives. Doesn't matter the length of our prayer or, or the loftiness of our words. No, it comes from a motivation of, of a heart that loves God. And Jesus says this, he goes on, he says, do not be like them, those, those pagans who babble on, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. And it's like, Jesus is like, let me just throw in one more wrench here for you. You mean I can't inform God what I need? <laughs> You know, God's not, I'm like, God, take this down, add this to your list. I'm, you know, I also need a, you know, a better pair of pants and another thing. I need this to work right. And I need this to go ahead. And I can't inform God. He already knows what I need. Well, then what's the point? Why even talk to God if he already knows what I need? And I don't think Jesus wants us to miss this point. You see, when, when Erica, my wife, now wife, when we were just dating, we were kind of early on in our dating, and, and Erica worked as a nurse in the NICU at a local hospital. So the NICU is kind of the ICU for the little preemie babies. And, and she had just started out there, hadn't worked there too long, so she's kind of low on the totem pole, so she worked the night shift. And I remember as we were dating that um, I thought, this is kind of a sweet deal. <laughs> I mean, we would, get, we would go on dates, you know, for about three days, and then she would have three or four days where uh, she would have to work at the hospital, these 12-hour shifts, and, and, uh, and then even recover from sleep. And so, so for me, it was like, all right, I get to go on dates with this girl for three days, and then I'm like a bachelor for the other half of the week. I can play paintball with the guys, video games. This is, you know, no pressure, no commitment. I mean, I couldn't if I wanted to. I mean, I, I remember that feeling when, when we were first dating, like, this is the perfect setup. And... Uh, don't judge me. It'd be all right. <laughs> and as we spent more time together, what seemed like the perfect setup all of a sudden became agonizing. What do you mean we can't see each other for three days? <laughs> what do you mean you got to get sleep? And, you know, I, all of a sudden, the more time we spent together, the more we fell in love together, to be apart from each other felt awful. <laughs> You see, because there's power when we get to be present with somebody. There's power when we get to be in the same room with somebody. I'm not the perfect father by any means, and there's choices I, I try to make better and better every day. But I've kind of decided to try to do at least one thing as a dad. I'm not always going to say the right thing. I'm not always going to do the right thing. I'm not always going to be a great dad. But I've decided when my kids remember me, I want them to remember that I was present. I want them to remember that I was at the game or I was in the room when this conversation happened or I was right there when this went down. Because there's power in just being present with somebody and being present makes it personal. You see, the most important thing you have in this world, it's not your marriage. It's not your kids, your family. It's not your job. It's, it's, it's not your purpose in life. It's not your mission. The most important thing you have in this world is an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ because everything else in life flows out from there. It's the best thing we have the best thing at our disposal, the most important thing for our life. And when we are able to be present with God, there's power in it and it makes it personal. And I think if we're honest, a lot of times when we think about prayer, it begs the question, well, how long do I gotta do it? <laughs> how long do I gotta stay in this secluded, this secret place, this, this place of sharing, this specific place? How long do I gotta spend there with God? And I think Jesus actually answers this question in the next part of the text. In verse nine, he says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I don't think Jesus is trying to give us another uh, formulaic prayer. No, because we know Jesus prayed in all different ways throughout the text of the Bible. But I think Jesus is giving us some key elements when it comes to our prayers. 
You see, I think Jesus knows that when we often spend time with God, we want to rush to the stuff, right? We want to rush to our stuff. You know, the stuff where, okay, God, here's what I want. Here's what I need. Here's what I need you to fix. It's, it, this is, I couldn't wait to talk to you because I got to tell you all my stuff. And Jesus is just saying, hold on a second. Hold on a second. How about this? Key element number one. How about you start with God? How about you start in your prayer time by simply declaring his greatness, declaring who he is, that he is holy, that he is hallowed, that he is almighty, that he is powerful. How about you spend some time before you rush to your stuff, you spend some time declaring God's greatness. Because the more time we spend understanding who we are talking to, the less big our problems then seem to be. The more time we understand who we are in conversation with and that he is listening, the more we can walk away with confidence knowing that he heard us and he can handle it. It changes the rest of our prayer. And then Jesus pushes us even further with another key element. And it's probably a key element that we wish was not there. God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, the next key element goes, okay, God, it's your agenda before mine. No matter how this prayer works out, no matter if you give me what I want or you don't, if it's yes, no, or maybe so later or whatever, God, it's your agenda before mine. I've been uh, in full-time vocational ministry now for a little over 20 years. And uh, I love, there's nothing more exciting than somebody who gives their life to Jesus. And, and we've done several baptisms here at, at Harborside, and we'll be doing several more this year as well. And, and there's typically a, a, a story, you know, we ask people to share their testimonies and, and what that looks like, what their journey looked like. And, and there's a story we, we hear that's often very similar, and it's a good story. But it starts like this. It starts, you know, when I was young, I grew up in in a Christian home, or I made a decision for Jesus at a young age. And then I went to college, or then I got a job in the real world, or then I moved to Tampa. <laughs> and all of a sudden something changed. And I realized that my prayers didn't sound so much like they did when I was a kid. I realized that I started praying things like, uh, let my kingdom come, let my will be done on earth. Who gives a rip about heaven? <laughs> Lord, give me today all that I want, all I can consume, and lead me not into temptation because I can find it all by myself. Thank you very much. Amen. <laughs> and our attitude shifted somehow. And the story typically continues. And so I went through relationship after relationship. I blew through money and I blew through success. I picked up an addiction along the way. And things in my life just seemed to fall apart until there was that one day Maybe it was that one evening when I got down on my knees and I lifted my hands to heaven and I said, I give up, God. I surrender. Not my will, but your will be done. And the moment that I did that is the moment my life changed. That's the story we hear over and over. That's the story we celebrate. Because the point of prayer is not to get stuff from God, but to come into alignment with the God of the universe. That's where personal relationships develop. That's where a secondhand faith becomes a firsthand faith. If you want to know how long do you need to pray with God, well, it depends on your heart's current condition. And Jesus modeled this for us. In John chapter 11, Jesus, he's going to raise a man from the dead, his buddy Lazarus. And Lazarus has been dead for four days and Jesus is going to raise him back. He's going to do this amazing miracle. And before he does it, he prays this prayer. It's a short prayer. It's a very simple prayer. And it goes something like this. God, I know what you're going to do. You know what you're going to do. Everybody watching doesn't know what you're going to do. So why don't you just go ahead and do it? And he's like, Lazarus, come out. And the man walks out of the grave. Jesus is in alignment with what God wants to do. And so it's a short prayer and it's time to get it done. But then if you were to go six chapters later in John chapter 17, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and he knows that the next day he's gonna be crucified on a cross. 
And at this time, it's not a prayer that lasts just a verse or two. It is a whole chapter of a verse that we, or a whole chapter of a prayer of Jesus that we get to read. That Jesus starts by, by going, God, I know what you want to do. I'm just not excited about it. I don't even know if I'm fully on board. And so he prays throughout the night and he agonizes. He's like, God, is there any other way we can save humanity? Is there any way you can take this cup from me and do something different? And he prays throughout the night, agonizing in conversation with God. So much so that, we, that the text tells us that he sweats drops of blood. He's so stressed out. He's so anxious. He's still pouring out to God that it takes him all night long until he comes to the end of his prayer where he says, okay, God, we've talked about this. We've worked through it. Not my will, but your will be done. If you want to know how long do we need to pray until you can declare his greatness and until you can surrender to his will, until you can say, God, I want your will for my life more than I want my will for my life. And sometimes that takes five minutes Sometimes things are going great and we're like, God, I love what you're doing right now. I love the path you have me on. I am in sync with you. This is great. And, uh, and that's all the time you need. But sometimes it takes hours. Sometimes when, when we're honest about where God wants us to do, where he wants us to go, who he wants us to talk with, we go, God, I know what you're saying. I'm just not there yet. And God says, that's okay. That's okay. Let's just stay here together a little longer. Let's just talk through this some more. And let's see if we can't leave this time together where your heart is aligned with mine. That's how long we'll stay in this. I love what Andy Stanley says. He says, when your faith intersects with God's faithfulness, that's when God becomes alive in your life. And it's emotional because it's personal. It's personal we get to have an intimate relationship, a personal relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ. And when you can declare his greatness in your time with him, when you can align your heart with his will, well, then the rest of it kind of just flows. The rest of it, we can go, okay, God, Give us the daily bread like you always do. I'm just gonna declare, God, that you're gonna give me daily bread today. You are gonna give me provision one day more. God, I'm gonna, gonna declare uh, forgiveness of my sins as I forgive others. I'm gonna declare the pardon you've given me through the blood of Jesus. And Lord, I'm gonna declare your protection over my life, that you would not lead me into temptation, but deliver me from evil. And let me just declare your praises some more. This morning, I thought it'd be fitting if we just end where we spend some time communing with God. In fact, Jesus instructs us that when we're together, spend some time with God. And so we have some communion elements here with us. We've got the bread that reminds us of his daily provision. We've got the cup which reminds us of the blood that was spilt so we could have a pardon, forgiveness from sin. And we could continue in conversation, declaring his protection, declaring his greatness, declaring his will for our life over our will for our life. And so what I'd like us to do in these next moments is just spend some time with God and, and where, you just start wherever you are. But I'm gonna tell you this, this is not the end of a conversation when we close out today. This is just the beginning of our daily conversation with God. This is something we want to make sure we spend time with God doing each and every day this week, that we find a place that's specific. We find a place that's secluded. We find a place that's secret. And what we share in that place doesn't even need to be shared with anybody else. It's just conversation with us and God. So would you take these moments and as you're ready, would you take the bread that reminds you of his provision? Would you take the drink that reminds you of his pardon? And if you got to sit a while and just declaring his greatness, then sit a while doing that. If you just got to sit a while trying to go, God, it's not my will, it's yours, then do that. And if you're able to do it, whatever, wherever you need to start is where you start. But the end of the service isn't the end of the conversation. It's just the beginning. And I challenge you as Jesus challenged 
people then and challenges us today to spend time, spend time with God in prayer this week. So again, take it as you're ready and I'll close us in prayer and we'll go from there. Father God, you are holy. Hallowed be your name. Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done. God, your kingdom come. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, you give us and continue to give us our daily bread. Thank you. Lord, would you forgive us of our sins as we are challenged to forgive people who sinned against us, Lord. May we follow your example, God. And Lord, deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us and protect us from evil. For yours, your name, you get all the credit, the power, the honor, the glory, God, forever and ever because you are an infinite omnipotent, omniscient, amazing God. You are worthy of it all. And we declare your praises, declare your will over our lives. And we declare all of this in the name of Jesus, amen. I wanna let you know one thing before we close today, and that is, if you're sitting there and you've never made a decision to enter into a relationship, a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've never done the most important thing you can do in this life. If you're watching online, we're going to put in uh, a little uh, link there in the chat and you can click on that. And uh, we'd love to talk to you more about that. We'd love to answer any questions you have. We'd love to just celebrate that with you. If you have no questions, but you've decided to make a decision for Jesus today. For those of you who are here live, we've got staff will be around all day today that uh, we'd love to have a conversation with you. If that doesn't work with you, we'd love for you to go to guest services and just fill out a little card and let us celebrate a decision or answer any questions you have. But we, we don't wanna leave today without giving you the opportunity to make the best decision you could ever make in your life. The most important thing, and all of life flows out from there, and that's a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a lopsided relationship, but he's inviting you into it today. Thank you all for being here. We love you. God bless, and you're dismissed. <laughs>